The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Next thing up is providing feedback and being responsive. Um, you may recall the seven stages of action um, where we understood that when you provide complete and continuous feedback, uh, this really helps to bridge the gulf of evaluation, right? Um, each user action that you do, that the user does requires some kind of feedback. Um, if it's just a key press in a word editor um, or just selecting a single menu, then the feedback can be very subtle, right? It's short and subtle uh, for interactions that happen a lot and that are small and that are not very impactful. Um, so clearly you don't want a text editor uh, like Word uh, when you press you know, the, the A key to enter the letter A, you don't want a dialogue to pop up. You press the letter A and then you confirm that dialogue with an OK, right? That would be a little bit too much. Um, but if you do more, you know, more important actions, infrequent actions, longer actions, main things like saving a file, deleting a file, you want more noticeable feedback, right? That, that clearly tells you what's going on. Um, and this whole feedback thing is something where you can really see why the graphic user interface um, outshines the textual user interface in many aspects of usability. Why? Because in a GUI, you can show the objects as little things on the desktop, right? If I have a file, uh, an image file, I can show a little icon on the desktop that represents that image file. I can even show a little preview of what's inside the image. And then the user can click on that image and then say, you know, delete it, drag it to the trash or open it or copy it or move it, whatever, right? Rename it. So it's a very easy, object selection and then the action kind of sequences, object action model of graphical user interfaces is really good to provide feedback because the moment I click on it, it's selected, I show a highlighted state, um, then the user knows I've now selected this object and not the one next to it. And then they can select a menu item that says duplicate this file, for example, right? It's very easy to visualize the object state. It's very easy to visualize the actions because I can show a menu bar and drop down menus that are all the available commands right there in front of me that I can select from. Um, I don't need to remember them like I would have to in a command line based interface. You know, think about the same interaction of duplicating a file in a command line based interface. First of all, a command line based interface greets you with a friendly little, you know, triangle. That's all, right? There's usually nothing there. If you want to see what directory you're currently at, you need to type in, you know, uh, what's the current directory. And if you want to see what's inside that directory or folder, you need to type, you know, on Unix, you need to type ls to see a list of the files that are in that folder. They are only listed textually. You don't get a little representation of what's inside these files, like, you know, the image of the flower. Um, you just see flower.jpg, right? That's all you see. And then if you want to delete or if you want to duplicate one of those files, you would have to, um, you enter a command for duplicating a file textually. You have to know this command by heart because you don't have a list of commands to select from, from a menu item. You need to remember it and type it in. Uh, you can make mistakes by typing it in and all these kinds of things can happen. And then you have to enter the right file name uh, that you just saw in the listing in the directory there. And you have to make sure you don't type the file name wrong because you know otherwise you may delete the, or, or duplicate the wrong file. So it's messy, right? And I cannot see which file I'm actually picking from the list because the list is just shown in my command line and I'm typing my command beneath that. It's a complete disconnect, right? The objects are not active things I can do stuff to directly. This whole concept of direct manipulation in the graphical user interface is really powerful in that way. And this is essentially what made the PC revolution possible, right? Without the graphical user interface, computers would not have had the chance to become so proliferate uh, and, and so ubiquitous in, in, in the modern world. Anyway, so that's why you know, providing feedback and, and providing responses to uh, and, and, and acting in a timely fashion is actually easier in a GUI because you have visual representations of things, of objects that you can show that feedback on, right? Um, the thing you want to make sure is that people can answer the, these, these fundamental questions they often ask themselves while they are inside an interaction, right? Um, where am I currently? Like, what's my current working directory? What, what files are currently in front of me in, in this directory? Or 
what's the system doing right now? Is it, you know, copying files or is it loading something? Is an application launching? Is it shutting down? What's going on, right? Um, these are things, and if you ask these questions and you don't get an answer, it's super frustrating. I mean, you know this, right? When you when you got your computer and it's just hanging there and it's showing you, you know, that little clock, you know, sand, uh, sand clock, hourglass turning over, or it's, you know, in, in, on the on the Mac, it's showing you the what people like to call the spinning pizza of death, um, you know, that little beach ball that that twirls and means that it's busy with something. It's frustrating because you don't know what's going on. You don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know why it's currently busy. You don't know if it's hung up or whether it is still, um, you know, working on something useful. So I want to show you an example from a, a, an old Windows dialog. We're going to talk about responsiveness, by the way, uh, more uh, in, in, in the later part of this lecture. But I want to show you an example from a Windows dialog, Windows 2000, this is long ago, um, that was there for copying files. And there are so many things wrong with this dialog. I don't even know where to start. Uh, the first thing is, um, okay, it's telling me that it's copying. That's good. But from where am I copying to where? From installer to installer. That's super useful, right? That doesn't tell me which way I'm copying it. I, I can't even verify whether I'm copying correctly from, you know, my USB stick to my hard drive or whether I make, made a mistake and I'm copying the other way around. Um, the next thing that's 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 wrong about this is is this animation. You you probably re remember this animation, right? So when as you do this copying, what's happening is that there's a little bit of paper flying from the left folder over to the right folder. And the, the amazing thing is when that piece of paper flies over there, it disappears and a new piece of paper appears on the left-hand side. What's happening here is it's, it's just a brain-dead animation, right? That just keeps going through the same seven images again and again and again. There is no actual, you know, there aren't actually paper you know, pieces being added to the right-hand side. It's always the same animation. Um, and so this could be useful if, for example, what I'm copying is a document of 52 pages, then each page here could actually be represented by one page flying over there. But that's not the case. It's a brain dead animation. It's the same animation when I'm copying, you know, a, a binary executable um, and the pages don't mean anything. Um, what's even worse, if you actually were to pull the internet you know, connection, like the, 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 the LAN cable, and you don't have Wi-Fi, um, this animation would continue. It would continue to happily fly from the left to the right because it's just an animation. It doesn't actually check on whether copying is taking place. It's just there as long as this dialogue is open. So it's a completely useless animation. I can see how you know Bill Gates was walking down you know the hallways of Microsoft Central in Redmond campus, and then he ran into this you know young inexperienced intern that had just come over from the local high school, and he said, um, "So you got anything to do?" And he's like, "No, okay. Why don't you create myself me some you know completely useless animations that just show paper flying from one folder to the other? Don't worry about whether it means anything. We'll just use this to entertain the user while the copying is happening, right?" And this interim went off and probably did his thing. So that's what it seems like, right? It, it doesn't mean anything. There's something even worse. If you were to, if this dialogue was copying, and let's assume the copying finishes, it could happen, and it was likely, that it stopped at a moment where the last piece of paper here was actually in midair, flying from one folder to the other. And then suddenly the dialogue disappeared. And I can see, you know, my I can see somebody, my mom would go like, wait a minute, that last page, it hadn't been copied yet. Where is it gone? You know, it's not in the starting folder. It was in the air, it's not in the, in, the, in the target folder. Did it, you know, like fall under the table or something? Where did it go, right? So that's really bad use of animation because you are actually leading the user into a false mental model, right? Into a false conceptual model. They think that this animation means something when, when it doesn't. So that's wrong about this animation. Um, but it gets better, right? It, you know the, the progress bar beneath this? Oh, I love progress bars. They're, they're awesome if they work. And they are the worst if they don't work. So this progress bar tells us 55 seconds remaining. Now, please raise your hand if you trust this estimate. 
yeah, you guys have been using computers too long, right? This is not true. It's not 55 seconds. We know that, right? Um, it, but the worst thing about this is it's not even roughly 55 seconds. Oftentimes, this dialogue jumps, right, wildly. There's this great story of, you know, the, the, the man who was driving home uh, to, to his wife from his job, and, and he was a Windows user, and she said, when are you going to be home? And he said, um, in five minutes. No, wait, two hours. Oh, no, three days. No, wait, five seconds. Right? That's the typical behavior of, of these dialogues when they are really bad at estimating how long the process is actually going to take. And that's terrible interface design, right? Don't do that. So there's two things wrong with this dialogue uh, or with this progress bar. First of all, 55 seconds, I don't care. What I care about is, is it going to take long enough for me to, you know, check my email? Or is it going to take so long that I can go and make myself a copy? Or is it going to take so long that I can go and have my lunch break? Or should I come back tomorrow? Right? These are the kinds of questions that people are interested in. They don't care whether it's 55 or 58 seconds, right? They won't look at their stopwatch and measure that. Um, so I don't want this precise information. I want a rough estimate. And I want that would also be, how should I say it, more honest. Yeah? It would be more honest because the computer doesn't know that it's 55 seconds. It's suggesting a precision that it actually doesn't have. So <clears throat> what systems have been moving to since then, and today you will see that when you when you do a um, um, a progress dialogue is that they will tell you about a minute, right? Or a few more seconds, right? Those are the kinds of things I'm interested in, or about two minutes or three minutes. That's a good verbal estimate that makes sense. Okay, so that about this, this, this dialogue. Don't suggest precision that you don't have. If you don't know how long it takes, be honest and say, I'm still calculating, I'm still estimating, and tell the user. And only once you have a reasonable estimate, show that reasonable estimate as an estimate and then it should always progress linearly if anything it should become shorter don't make it become significantly longer rather do a you know a slightly pessimistic estimate in the beginning and then you know if things go faster than you anticipated you know usually people aren't going to complain right then it's not going to throw them off um and then we get to the progress bar itself how many people here have seen a progress bar that advances and then at 99 percent it stops and it sits there forever right that's terrible this is completely useless don't do a progress bar if you can't do a linear progress the only thing that makes sense in a progress bar think about it is when i look at the progress bar in this state i expect the thing to be halfway done so if I have been waiting for two minutes to get to this point, I expect the rest to take two more minutes. That's, that's why the progress bar is there. If it, however, advances and then stops at the end or suddenly jumps in giant hoops and then stops forever, it completely defeats the use of the progress bar. It's not no longer a linear estimate. And the worst designs, however, go to 99%, sit there for a while, and then they go to 100% and you're like, oh, finally, and then the dialogue goes away and comes back and says, now I'm finishing the installation or whatever it is, right? And there's another progress bar. How useless is that? It doesn't help me at all. It's very easy to program technically. I understand that, you know, if you're a bored, stupid, lazy programmer, it's quick to build that, but it's completely useless for the user. They want to know how long is the overall process going to take. I remember in, in, the, in the best times, Windows had like installations, had these progress bars that would pop up and fill themselves at lightning speed and there would be hundreds of them and you're like wow this is a very fast system it's doing all these progress bars right but they were completely useless right they weren't actually helping me in estimating how long the installation was going to take so understand what progress bars are for build them right make them advance linearly and never ever freeze at 99 percent you know that's just evil all right i think you now got the general gist that i don't like bad progress bars um I want to tell you, show you a little bit more about menu selection. Um, and this is to, to show you that interface design is really a fine art in some places. It's about the small details that make the difference whether something feels right or whether they feel somehow wrong. So um, I'm going to show you this using videos um, because uh, this is otherwise hard to catch. So here's an example of, or maybe before I show you this video, I'm going to ask you, that's even better, what happens when you select a menu item on your computer. 
So you drop down the menu, you know, and you select an item. What what do you think? Just out of your uh, the, what you remember, what happens visually? I mean, the menu bar is up. The the drop down menu is open. You pick an item from that menu. What happens? Uh, sure. Yeah, I just clicked on something and yeah, I created a new file. So it just happens when I click on the button. It just happens. Nothing okay. else pops up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. You're right, uh, you know, new file obviously opens a file dialog and that's usually the overwhelming thing that happens. And that's good feedback because you get the dialog that you're looking for. But I'm talking about a finer effect. I'm gonna show you what I mean. When Let's look at this. This is uh, a drop down menu uh, in macOS Catalina and we are selecting an, a menu item like new finder window, for example. And now pay attention to what happens. Did you see that? Just before the menu went away, we selected the new folder thing, something happened. Uh, let me see, maybe I can play that again. Um, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna play that one more time for you. It blinked once, do you see that? So what's going on there is you go down to the new folder thing, where you click, it gets unselected briefly, it gets selected again, and then the menu fades away very quickly in a fast animation that probably via Zoom, you don't even see that fading effect. It's really a fraction of a second. But the blinking, you should have been able to see. And you might say, well, who cares, right? But this is super essential because what that does is the moment you click and then release, you know, you actually only select when you release, right? Um, you may actually not be 100% sure which menu item you selected because your menu, your mouse might have slid just a little selecting something else, right? And you wanna be sure that you selected the right item. So if the menu just goes away, if you were just to remove it at that moment when the user lets go and you're like, okay, I know what he selected, I'm just gonna delete everything and, and make it invisible, you would actually take away an important piece of feedback for the user. I'm gonna show you something. Um, here um, from a uh, an installation. Uh, this is a this is an installation of a GNOME uh, Linux distribution, uh, and this is a CD version. So the one that you can uh, boot right off the CD. Uh, and sure, you can configure it to, to behave differently. Um, uh, but it, and if you have a full installation, it actually uh, does a little fade out effect when you select a menu. But if you just boot from the CD, it doesn't have that fade out effect. And I'm sure going to show you what that looks like. Right. So again, I'm going to go back and do that again. It just goes away. And if you were to use that, right? So in the one moment it's it's there, and the next moment it it actually just is basically the menu is gone, your selection is gone, everything's gone. It feels like you're walking on ice. It feels like you're not really sure what did I just select? Did I pick the right menu option here? Did I really select undo or did I maybe select redo? Um, what what just happened? Right. Um, it's a very fine detail, but it's important. This is feedback that's that's designed carefully. Um, if you were to run a classic installation of macOS from macOS nine times, or or you know any any all the way back to system one, you could actually the user could select how many times he wanted this uh, this blinking effect to happen because some people like it to be more pronounced and more clear. Like it would flash one or two or even three times for you, depending on what you selected as a user. This this user setting has gone away in Mac OS X, um, but it's it shows how much attention um, you know needs to be paid to these small details. Okay, um, as we talk about feedback, um, it's not just about visual feedback. Of course, it's also about auditory feedback. Um, and haptic feedback as well. This is why it's so important to actually uh, be able to feel keys, right? We all know that when we type on our smartphones, um, if you don't look at the key, the keys at the moment when you're typing, after a while, your fingers will just drift away from the, where the keys are because you have nothing to feel, right? You don't actually sense the keys. So there's nothing to, for your fingers to orient themselves on. And also when you tap, you don't get a physical feedback usually on your smartphone touchscreen uh, that you actually tap the key. Now this can be simulated by shaking the whole device with a little tap um, that, that makes the whole screen vibrate um, so that you have a feeling as if you tapped. And that actually, you can you can fool the, the sense of haptics quite well by uh, of humans. 
Um, but the, the this 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 pre-sensing of the key before you actually type uh, anything is super important. That's why it's easy to type eyes free on a physical keyboard, but it's really hard on a glass keyboard. So haptic feedback can sometimes be um, um, you know uh, taken care of through, for example, um, uh, acoustic feedback. Right? If you don't have uh, haptic feedback, you can sometimes simulate it with with acoustics. Um, uh, but if you ever you know, bought a bought a ticket at the uh, you know ticket automate uh, auto, uh, ticket machines of the Deutsche Bahn in the in the, in the railway station, um, you will see that if you don't get any feedback, it feels really weird. You know? Or if there's only visual feedback, you're kind of missing something. There's something missing in the in the physical interaction. So even though physical keys are maybe half a cent more expensive in a device design than adding a capacitive sensor because mechanical moving stuff is always more expensive. Um, consider using it for, if you ever design any embedded device or IoT things, consider adding a few buttons um, if they really make operation easier. Okay. Um, we actually went uh, so far and simulated haptic feedback in a research prototype where we uh, you know, glued a mag magnet to the user's finger and then we had these electromagnets on a, in a field and they would actually create electromagnetic fields that would give you haptic feedback even when you were in the air above the, um, above the screen. So that's what we did with haptic feedback in our research. Now, this was number four, feedback. Um, number five is minimizing memory load. Um, as we know, short-term memory is limited. Um, there used to be this number of the seven, magical number seven. Uh, more recent research showed that actually the magical number is more like four. So short-term memory of the user can hold roughly four items, uh, maybe one more, maybe one less, depending on you know how alert you are, whether you had a coffee and stuff, stuff like this. So what that means is in a user interface, I don't want to overload the user's short-term memory with stuff because I want to make sure that they actually um, can operate the system competently, right? So you shouldn't ask the user to um, like type in a password and then ask them five minutes later, oh, now type in that password again um, that you just entered uh, when they didn't have a chance to write it down yet or something like this. Or you might give people, um, you know, a, you display a URL in a text and then you say later on, hey, oh, by the way, you remember the URL I showed earlier, that's where you find the help page, right? That's bad design. Uh, don't make people type in things twice. If the computer, you know, um, if you if the user typed it in once, for example, they typed in um, their address, you know, then remember that kind of stuff. Don't make it uh, type, make them type it in twice. Um, and when you display information, uh, you should place it so that it you use Gestalt laws so that it's easy to parse visually. What I mean by that is, um, remember all the Gestalt laws that tell us this is how you group something, and this is how you keep things apart, and this is how people perceive something as a unit, right? Uh, law of proximity and the law of closed shape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these you can use to structure your UI so that it's easy to parse visually, and that makes it easier for people to memorize the interface and mem minimizes their memory load. But probably the most direct link to minimizing memory load comes in the form of help. If your system requires any codes or abbreviations or keyboard shortcuts or things like that, uh, or uses special terminology, then give users easy access to a help page that they can open up to see these things. Um, I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. Um, just before that, maybe um, this is another reason why GUIs have an advantage, right? In, in a GUI, I can show the user all the commands that are available. Uh, the command line interface requires the user to remember the available commands in their head and then type them in. Yes, there is auto completion that helps you a bit with that, um, but um, you know usually it's um, it's easier to show interface elements or commands available in the graphical user interface. So don't write a you know a setup wizard in which you ask the user to enter some information or pick some pick a username or something like that, and then ask them to remember information from step one again in 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 step seven. Right? That's that's not a good design. Here's a good design. Um, you can actually um, when you if you ever struggle with oh how do I create you know um, a I don't know um, a copyright sign on this keyboard. 
you can open what's called the keyboard viewer on the Mac and it will show you a tiny little keyboard. And what's better is if you hold down any of the uh, modifier keys, like, you know, here, for example, the this alt key, this option key is being held down, uh, either physically on the keyboard or by clicking it in this little keyboard viewer, it will actually show you the option key um, uh, layout of that keyboard. So you can see all the special characters at one, at one glance, where they are and how to type them if you want to type them often with a keyboard shortcut. Of course, you can also pick them from a list graphically, but you know maybe you want to learn how to type a copyright uh, sign efficiently because you use it a lot. Um, and any dead keys that only add apostrophe, uh, add ac accents of certs to, to the existing letter rather than creating a letter on their own are being highlighted in orange here in this. And here you can see we're holding down uh, option and shift here in the lower part of this. And that shows us that there are yet another uh, set of special uh, symbols that we can create by holding down both of these keys at the same time. Another example is right from Keynote that I'm using to present to you here today. Um, if I go to the help menu, it doesn't just have the usual, yeah, yeah here's the help uh, system for Keynote, but it actually has right there a, well, a shortcut if you want to the keyboard shortcuts, right? It's a direct pointer to the page of Keynote where it shows you nicely, what are the keyboard shortcuts that I can use in Keynote? Because when you're presenting, uh, you often need to use keyboard shortcuts because you know fiddling around with the mouse isn't possible in presentation mode. Um, and there are some really useful keyboard shortcuts that you should know as a presenter. Um, so that's good design, right? That gives you access to these, you know, through help pages to this information that people might not have in their short-term memory um, or might have forgotten because they haven't used the software for a while. Now, uh, moving on, um, error handling. Errors happen, right? We know people make mistakes. We've talked about slips and mistakes in Norman's book. And one of the reasons why I shared this information about slips and mistakes with you is I wanted to, I wanted you to get used to the fact that people make these kinds of mistakes. These, especially these like un, unintentional or um, um, non-intentional uh, slips that just happen because you were just a little absent-minded, right? So we need to deal with these, um, they will happen. We can minimize the chance of them happening by designing our interface carefully. And that's always the best if you can avoid these errors to happen, great, right? Then the user won't go down that dark uh, path, but they still will make some sorts of mistakes. So in these cases, you need them to help recover from them. Why? Because any errors lead to stress, right? Um, <coughs> People often say, oh, I want to build a user interface that can detect human emotion. And it's a super difficult research topic even today to detect, you know, what kind of emotional state is Ezra in right now, right? We don't know. It's, it's, it's super hard to read that from like the user's face and their whatever body sensors and what else we could do. But there's one very simple way to predict the user's emotions. If you write a piece of software and that piece of software has a routine that displays an error message, I can guarantee you that the user is pissed off. Nobody likes error messages, right? When the user sees an error message, they are not in a happy state. I can tell you that. So that part I can, I can promise you. So what that means is whenever we are in an error situation in our software, we need to be extra careful to be constructive, to be simple in how we offer help, to be very concrete about what we tell the user about the mistake that just happened and how they can recover from it. So they need comfortable, easy instructions on how to get out of the mess that they just ended up in. That also means that if somebody just makes a single mistake, the system shouldn't change irreversibly uh, by just pressing one letter on my keyboard. I shouldn't be able to delete my entire hard disk, right? Um, or if I can, then I should be easily able to revert and say, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me back up. And that recovery is usually the best choice, right? Giving people this undo option. So what are ways to avoid mistakes in the first place? Well, for example, uh, if you ask the user to um, type in uh, their username when they log on to a system, then they can mistype it. If you show them a list of usernames that they can select their username from, they can't mistype it. So that's an easier way of avoiding mistyping, right? The same thing applies to anything where users are typing in something that's really picked from a small set of things like uh, 
the maybe a city name or street name in, in, in Aachen or something like this. All of these things can often be pulled from a list and you can have people start typing it and then autocomplete for them um, uh, with a clever algorithm so that you avoid having entries that are illegal um, to begin with. Um, another example is if people are supposed to type in their age and years, don't let them type in letters, right? Just turn off the letters to be able to enter there so that they don't make a mistake. Um, if you are looking for, if you say like, oh, I can't write a system where people cannot make mistakes. Well, look at arcade machines, arcade game machines, right? Um, if you play a round of Pac-Man, there are no user errors you can make in the operation. Yes, you can get horribly eaten by, you know, Binky and the other little ghosts, but you don't have the situation that people say like, oh, you entered the high score name you're there, but you made a mistake. You need to go back and do this again. It doesn't happen, right? So these systems are carefully designed not to have any user error messages other than, you know, the horrible deaths you can die in the game itself. Um, another example is um, when you um, enter a file name to save a file with, um, then um, the system can help you by, for example, changing these illegal characters that you entered and proposing to use other characters that are legal in the file name. You know, every system has some characters that cannot be really used in file names. Um, like on Windows, you can't use a slash in a file name because that's, you know, the path divider. On the Mac, uh, the, the colon is a, is a sign that you cannot use because it used to be the path divider in, on, on the Macintosh. Um, and so what, for example, classic Mac OS did is if you typed a colon, it would just replace that with a hyphen instead. Um, it would do that silently, which is kind of a bit against the principle of least surprise, because if I meant to type a colon, why am I suddenly seeing a hyphen? So a little bit of a hint that it was changed would be in order, I think. But at least I wasn't ending up with an illegal file name that I had to manually then correct. If you want to see the worst dialogue that I've ever seen telling me that I made a mistake in my file name, you don't need to look any further than Mac OS X in its current versions. If I type in a name with a colon now, it's actually gotten worse than a uh, classic Mac. It just tells you the name A colon B cannot be used. And I don't know who wrote this, this dialogue message. It's almost evil in, in how it phrases it. It says, try using a name with, you know, maybe fewer characters, maybe they were too long, or maybe you used punctuation marks that I don't like. It's, it's like this, it's like it's trying to give you a riddle. It's like Gandalf trying, telling, giving you like a magical message that you're supposed to decode. Like, what's the problem, right? Why isn't just telling me colons don't work in file names, use something else, buddy, right? That would have been easy, but it would have required to type and design more than one error message. And somebody was just incredibly lazy designing that part of the finder interface of Mac OS. So that's really bad design. Now, um, if people do make mistakes, and they will, uh, then offer them a way to reverse, right? Offer them a way to undo what they did. Um, ideally, don't just offer an undo of the last step, but un offer undos of several steps. You know, good software has that, like drawing software, etc., that will let you step back many steps in your history. Um, this lowers the anxiety. This is an interesting side effect because now users know errors are, in are correctable. So they're no longer like, ooh, I need to make sure I hit the right key, otherwise I'm destroying things. And they will actually be encouraged to try out new stuff. If I have a, uh, you know, if I'm using Photoshop and I know I can step back many, many steps, I'm going to try that crazy, you know, pop art filter and see what it does because I know I can revert, right? So it encourages people to learn and, and explore stuff for more. Um, and ideally, this happens, you know, at multiple undo levels. In fact, undo is a research topic, right? It's not as simple as you might think because there is undo of a single last action. So just going back one state, and that's something that you nowadays, you get that rolled even into modern GUI toolkits, right? They will give you persistent storage that has undo uh, functions built in. If you write a modern like iOS app, for example, you get core data as a data model, and it will just give you the option to go back to the last state of the database for free, right? You don't need to code anything. You just add, add an undo button and say, this is undo button and, and you're done. Ideally, you should have multiple undos and at multiple levels. Um, I'll show you an example of that here. Uh, so here is uh, Photoshop running, Adobe Photoshop. And this is a short video, about 20 seconds, uh, where you can see the user being able to undo the actions that have been done. And even more so, uh, 
um, the user can also delete the history of actions and that he can still undo from, from the menu. So uh, watch this uh, short demonstration here. So here we have move, uh, free transform, move. These steps, we can, we can go back in our history. The history is visually shown in this history panel here um, so that we can go back and we can even take individual things out, right? We can crop the undo tree here. But if we did that and we didn't like what we did to the undo history, we can undo the change of the undo history. That is sort of nightmare material, but um, it is very powerful. And people who work with you know, graphical tools like Photoshop as professionals really do appreciate the, you know, the many layers of undo and redo functionality that it offers. Now, um, the next, next rule up, number seven, is for about dialogues and, and exits and, and safe spaces in a way. When a user in, is, in, is any, in any kind of dialogue state with the system, they often have three questions, and these are the most common ones. The first one is, where am I? You know, you're, you're ordering something online and you're wondering, um, have I put this into my shopping cart or am I still selecting things or am I already, have I already bought this or, or what's going on, right? Um, the second thing, the second question that, that a user will ask themselves when they're interacting with the system is, what can I do here? So what are the options that are, are available to me? And the third one that's often asked, especially in you know if you're browsing on the web, but also if you're using a more complex app, uh, how do I get back to where I was? Right? That's that's the famous back button, right? The probably most often used button in, um, on 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 the web is you know going back to where you were before because we we explore, we go back, we retrace our steps, and this is very much like what we talked about early on in one of the first lectures when we talked about visibility and affordances. Right? Remember the Swedish hairdryer. Uh, what's the state of the system? What are the available functions? Um, and how do I execute these functions, right? Those were things that we asked when we looked at the hairdryer and that we ask when we interact with any kind of system. This is very similar here, right? Uh, what's the state of the system? That's like, where am I in, in the dialogue? What can I do here? That's the available functions. And, you know, how do I get back to where I was is one of those things that is about undo and recovering from, from maybe things that I didn't want to do. So it kind of links back to the last um, golden rule. How can we help with these? Well, with number one, we know where am I? And, and also number two, what can I do here? We can address these with visibility and affordances and uh, those kind of good natural mappings, et cetera, right? Um, and also where am I, you can also provide you know, decent feedback um, to users knowing that when they enter a new state in, a, in an application. But how do I get back to where I was? That's one that, that isn't easy, as easy to address with these rules that we already know. So what we need to provide to in systems are clear exits, meaning that there should always be a notion of how do I get back to what users consider a safe, uh, a safe point in, in the interaction. For websites, that's often the home home uh, screen, right? So oftentimes, I'm sure you've done this before. You look for something on a website, and and things are getting confusing. You're not sure, you know, and and you just recover by let me go back to the home page of this of this company or whatever it is, right? Um, so that's a that's a good way to help people do this in an application. Um, if an application is acting up uh, on my smartphone, I just kill it, right? So and or on the desktop, I would quit the app and relaunch it. So that is you know, how you clearly exit a particular state. Um, but I'm not just talking about clear exits, I'm also talking about closed dialogues in this role. And a closed dialogue means providing the user with the feeling that they have completed a step once, once they've done so. So giving them a chance to take a breath, uh, relax and free their mind for the next step in the interaction. What do I mean by this? Well, let me show you an example. Uh, this is an old uh, image from, from uh, the Amazon homepage, uh, and that's a user who had just ordered something after stepping through a multi-step multi process that you know, right, from ordering something on Amazon. The last page, uh, once you were done, was, thank you, your order has been placed, with a thank you, and your order has been placed in big orange letters, right? This is really 
I mean, look at what your eye is doing, right? It's probably jumping to that fairly quickly. All the Gestalt laws and the visual design rules are in place here and, and working for you. Um, and then it says an email confirmation has been sent to you. So this gives me a lot of reassurances, right? My order has been placed. I know that this has now gone out and you need no longer worry about has the order actually been you know, put into the system or not. And I know that I uh, can find an email confirmation in my email inbox. Um, so this is good feedback about closing a, you know, a dialogue sequence of purchasing an item. Um, even more so, we see the, um, you know, if we do want to recover, if we want to do basically an undo step here, we can review or edit our order. That's right below that. As you can see, uh, there's a little link for doing this. So that's a good example. That's, that's a good design. Um, if you look at how, uh, you know, how this works in more recent versions of, of Amazon's website, that actually has become visually a little less obvious. So um, I don't think they've done a, a good job of improving that UI, but rather gone back a little. Now, on the other hand, here's a, uh, here's a, a wonderful dialogue box that uh, you know, somebody found. Um, you know, some, I don't even know what kind of tool that was, you know, but obviously some connection was lost. And would you want to reconnect? And you can answer with yes or OK. Um, that's a wonderful dialogue box, right? Um, so that's not exactly how you want to provide your feedback. Now, um, rule number eight. Rule number eight is about including help and documentation. We already mentioned that you want to have, for example, um, a short list of um, keyboard shortcuts and things like that available right in your help menu. But that's just the start of it, right? Um, help is actually a hierarchy of systems. Let me give you an example. Um, when you are using a system and you're just confused about, uh, I don't know, let, let's assume it's supposed to use interface. What does this button do, right? Then you would just hover over it. And after a second, you know, a tooltip would pop up, right? And tell you what you can do here. You know, they, these things more generally are called dynamic descriptors. Um, and they are very quickly available, immediately available to me. Um, but they also only hold very, very little information, right? Very short text, right? You can't put a whole manual into a tooltip. So that's, a, that's one end of the, of the design continuum that we have. On the other end is, you know, the printed manual, which I need to find, you know, somewhere <laughs> on the shelf or the PDF on my computer somewhere and open it up. And I don't have a connection anymore to my current state of interaction. I need to find the corresponding page in the manual but then it can be really lengthy and, and, and in-depth and really tell me all I need to know about the intricacies of a particular feature of a computer application. And in between, we have online tutorials, references, online help, context-sensitive help. Um, and basically, it's a continuum because uh, on, you know, on the left-hand side, you've got this very short, but immediately available tooltip, and then things get more and more elaborate and more inform informative and more detailed, but they also become harder to access, right? As you go over towards the online reference to or tutorials, videos, printed documentation, et cetera. But all of these make sense, right? They are for different kinds of supporting the user with help and documentation. We also know that you know the golden rule says users don't read manuals. Um, that's just a, a sad truth that uh, developers and, and technical writers learn over the course of the careers. They don't read manuals except when they do, right? When there is a problem and then the manual is available, it can mean the difference between them solving the problem or placing a support call and then taking up valuable um, time and, and, and cost of the company that needs to run these hotlines, right? So when, when help and documentation is so important, we might say, well, can't we do a better job at providing it by being a little bit more active and proactive about it in our software? Yes, we can. Um, assistants or at wizards as, as they're called under, under well, Windows um, are an example of this. 
uh, what they do is they will take over the interaction in to a certain degree and show me how to do something or lead me along doing it. But the danger here is that the system is taking over initiative, which can quickly break rule number three of predictability. Um, that's why um, it is something to do carefully, right? For example, um, you know, try this out. Uh, I'm not sure how it works under Windows, but on, on, on Mac OS, you can type in a help term. And if the help term is actually a menu entry, um, then it will show you where that menu entry is in which menu or submenu you can find that. And it will highlight it for you, but it won't select it for you, right? It will tell you this is where you can find it if you want it. So, you know, it's a, it's a careful dance here designing this so that the user doesn't feel like control is taken away from them completely and the system is starting to do things that they didn't intend to um, while still giving them a little bit more active support in their help request. Now, rule number one said to keep things simple. Uh, and rule number nine is a typical example of you know, one that will conflict with rule number one um, because it rule number nine says address diverse user needs. What do we mean by this? Well, there is one dichotomy that we've talked about already, uh, the novice expert dichotomy of users. It's, it's an overused uh, term and, and, and dichotomy, and there are many, many other um, you know, fine details in how users differ than just noobs versus experts, but it's one that we can often identify in a user population. So you want basically novices to be able to get more information and more explanations about the interaction, whereas frequent users that know the system want less fussy and they want faster interaction. Um, they will value things like you know, keyboard shortcuts, ideally ones that they can configure. So everything is using Emacs shortcuts because that's what I grew up with and I wanna always use them, right? Um, macro recording to capture whole you know, actions, um, sequences of actions to be playback played back again in a single step. Programmability, which is kind of an extension of macro recording. And they want quick responses without un, you know, unnecessary feedback, where unnecessary means unnecessary to them, right? The frequent user. So in order to address both of these, um, I'll have some examples on how you can do that, but it's, it's a tricky line to walk again, right? It's hard to satisfy both uh, communities. I'll show you some examples on how you can. Also then uh, you will typically see different age ranges, different cultural backgrounds, different um, you know, levels of technology affinity uh, between people, you know, these things vary widely uh, and they will require different interfaces because they have different expectations of the UI. Um, technology affinity is, is a fancy term for enjoys playing with technical gadgets, right? And that varies widely among people. I know that you know, among the people listening in here today, uh, technology affinity is probably on the positive side, right? We all kind of enjoy our gadget, gadgets to a certain degree because you know you all picked a very technical field to study. Um, but there's tons of people out there who don't have that excitement for new technology at all. And rightly so, they, they don't need to, it's not their fault, certainly not. Um, but this needs to be something that you're aware of. And when you design for that kind of uh, user community, don't make the same assumptions um, that you know from your own experience about how excited you are to explore a new function in an interface, for example. So the addressing of diverse user needs puts you in a conflict um, with keeping the interface simple. And then if in doubt, then always keeping it simple is more important. Uh, and that means that oftentimes you may have to focus your interface on the user group. For example, when we uh, redesigned an interface for the university, uh, that was supposed to be used both by students and by people working in the ZPA, uh, the central administration's office, um, we found that it actually needed two different interfaces, one for the student and one for the ZPA member, uh, staff member, because they, their tasks and their experience and the frequency with which they would be using it were so various, so different, that it didn't make sense to create the same interface for both. You may wonder, uh, and you know, but is there a way to make one UI that you know serves them all, kind of like the one ring? Well, there is. Um, here's an example that that I like a lot um, from um, 
uh, somebody I, I met at Stanford when he was still a PhD student. He's now a professor. Um, and uh, this was Francois Gambretier. And he designed a really clever menu system for working with content, for example, on interactive walls or, or like, you know, scribbling boards. Um, and the way this works was you would select um, you would select individual items by crossing these lines. Uh, so for example, to select the um, zoom function, you would go out the top because this is the item menu. And then when you cross this line, the, sub, the, the menu entries on this menu, on the item menu are highlight, move and zoom. And they appear once you've crossed this line. And once they've appeared, you select zoom by going back to the center through cross via crossing this line in the segment of the zoom entry. Seems complicated, but actually is fairly easy to use with a, this is a use, use with a pencil or, or an interactive pen usually, right? Um, so you would say, okay, so that's a pop-up menu with a weird like crossing based interaction. Uh, what's the big deal? Well, the interesting thing is once you've selected zoom a couple of times, you've learned that it is kind of like a P-shaped um, command, right? So you can get maybe get used to the fact that by pressing down the, the, the pen and doing this P-shaped command, uh, you can trigger that you can you can trigger that zoom function. And once you got used to that, you could just do that quickly and the menu wouldn't even appear, right? The graphical menu would not get rendered immediately. It would stay out of your way, it would not confuse you. Or, or clutter the interface, it would just basically look for that gesture and do the zoom action. But if you ever forgot about the gesture because you haven't used the system for six months, you can just you know, hold down the pen, wait for a fraction of a second and the menu pops back up and you can go back to the beginner mode if you like, in which the menu appears and you get to select your thing, taking all the time in the world that you need. The result here is that you have a fluid and reversible transition from the menu selection, which is the beginner mode, to a gesture command, which is kind of like the expert mode. I should maybe explain that you know this was also for sketching. So in order to do any of what I just talked about, you had to hold down sort of a, a modifier button on the pen, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to tell apart sketching lines from from uh, command input. So you can check this out. It's called Post Brainstorm. Is a wonderful paper um, many years ago at WIST. Um, that, that shows the, and there's also a video out there that shows you how it works. Here's another nice example. Um, let's say you are a pretty um, advanced uh, user. Um, so you wanna you know, define keyboard shortcuts, okay? Uh, support for that is built into the operating system here in macOS. And uh, here's the shortcuts panel that we can see. And the way it works though, is actually, um, quite easy. So, so the interface to change keyboard shortcuts is a simple one. It's a graphical interface. Why? Well, I've used the system as a whole for a while. I'm becoming a pro. I want to set my keyboard shortcuts. But that doesn't mean that I've ever used the keyboard shortcuts app, right? In using the keyboard shortcuts definition app, I'm a newbie, right? I this Nobody, hopefully, will ever use this on a daily basis, right? Changing their keyboard shortcuts every day. So, Pretty much everybody will always remember, remain a newcomer using this in, this application. So that's why it is designed to be easy to use, even though it is dealing with quite an advanced topic that only people who have used the system as a whole for a while uh, will, will, will enter. So um, this is the rule for you know, addressing diverse user needs and being aware that just because somebody is, is now entering an advanced feature or, or doing things like defining shortcuts doesn't mean that you can throw a cryptic, you know, regular expression-based textual syntax uh, tree at them um, because, you know, they don't do that particular task very often. And so they are still a newbie at that task. The 10th and final rule is be aware that, you know, amazing as you are, you may not necessarily be the world's best graphic designer. So just as you know, you've learned how to you know structure your classes in C plus um, plus. You know these people have learned how to draw things that look great, and that's a different skill, right? Here's an example. This is a logo from a from an application 
um, an outlining application, um, Omni Outliner. And notice how this is this logo is actually, it's basically, it's at this point, it's full page graphic artwork, right? This is not a few pixels. Uh, this is lots and lots and lots of pixel shades and 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 all the graphic fa graphical fanciness that requires a pro to do it. Now you might say, "Oh, I need I, I I've hired a graphic designer to design this big artwork. Now I need it in smaller uh, versions for you know the icons on the screen and the and the home screen and and the little menu bar item or whatever, uh, the task bar. So I can just scale this down, right? Using Photoshop scale down function, right?" Well, you could, but it's not the best result. Notice that as we see this thing getting scaled down more and more with the last version that is only, I don't know, maybe like 16 by 16 pixels or something, the designer actually decided to give up on the idea of trying to show two pages. The blue page disappears in the smallest design of the logo. So the logo actually changes qualitatively from its bigger cousins. And that's because somebody with a visual eye for it noticed that it would get too cluttered and too hard to visually you know, recognize at this size. So he completely removed the blue, um, uh, the, the, the blue second page here. A Photoshop's scale down function couldn't do that, right? It would just basically scale down every pixel um, equally and still show, try to show that blue-ish sort of you know, line there. And you probably wouldn't know what it is supposed to mean at this size. So these are the kinds of decisions that you wouldn't even consider as a developer uh, that you know, graphical artists are, are, and graphic designers are trained in. Here's another ex example of an, a terrible interface. Somebody obviously found the function to create a tab, um, you know, you know, to create tabs in, 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 in Windows, in a Windows user interface, and then just went crazy with it, right? Um, but not just that, it's, it's way too many tabs. It's also, look at the colors that have been used, right? It's like red, yellow, and green. And it seems like all the colors I'm only ever seeing in all the uh, student example projects that, that we do are always full on red or full on green or full on blue. And sometimes a yellow, right? Because that, that can be created by turning full, two colors to full on. And guess what? There are more colors than that. If you only use these like, full on red, green, blue, yellow colors, you are making a statement. And that statement is kind of like what this is suggesting that you are cheap, right? This is kind of the color of cheap supermarkets. Um, so be aware of your color choices that they have an influence. We talked about color already in visual design a bit. Um, so that's just a rem reminder that these things are uh, typically best left to an expert. All right, so that's the 10 golden rules of interface design. Keeping it simple as the most important rule, using terms from the application domain, not your technical domain, being consistent, remembering the principle of least surprise, and then providing feedback and being responsive. Responsive will expand on in the next section of the class. Minimizing memory load by providing people with information rather than asking them to remember it. Avoiding errors, helping recover, and offer, offering undo. This often makes use of things like constraints um, that we've already talked about. Designing clear exits, you know, how do I get out of here, and closed dialogues, um, when am I done with this? Including help and documentation on this whole um, continuum of options. Addressing diverse user needs and making sure that we help you know, experts to, um, you know, tune the system, fine tune the system to their needs while not making it hard to use for beginners. And then finally, remembering when to hire a graphic designer. So let's get into responsiveness and performance. As I said, um, this was a topic that I wanted to expand on a little bit uh, from the 10 golden rules. There is a wonderful, uh, chapter in the book GUI bloopers by Jeff Johnson. Uh, this is an awesome book. Uh, Jeff Johnson wrote uh, a book that basically, when you open it up, it has one bad inter user interface after the other in it. And it's hilarious to look at and, 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 and go through and say like, oh, look at that, you know, stupid user interface, until you get to that page where you're like, oh, I've made that mistake before. So um, it's an entertaining read. Take a look at it. And um, 
in this book, GUI Bloopers, uh, Jeff has a nice section about responsiveness um, and identifies it as, as the, the sort of the key usability problem of many interactive systems. Um, why is this the case? Well, because uh, bad responsiveness opens the gulf of evaluation. So it basically breaks something in our seven stages of action model here. Um, and uh, here are some examples of bad responsiveness. Um, a screen pointer, like you know, your, your mouse cursor not keeping up, right? That basically starts jumping. Or I click a button and there is a noticeable delay to the response of my button click um, before the button actually inverts and, 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 and does something, right? Or sliders and scroll bars that lag behind me dragging them. Um, or applications that go dead you know, during disk operations and just sit there and you can't do anything, right? Uh, where the software is basically behaving as if it would take no time at all to do this, and you know we're just gonna let the user look at a frozen interface until the disk has you know, operation is completed, or you know screens getting repainted multiple times before the final uh, layout is there. We've I think you've all seen these examples, um, and so let's look at first of all why are they there? Why do these things exist? Well, first of all. The importance of responsiveness is still not as widely known as it should be. Um, because even though people are aware, aware of usability these days, um, even UI designers tend to think of other things first, you know, good mappings, natural mappings, and following the other rules, the golden rules that we've talked about. Um, and since responsiveness is a dynamic thing, you can't see it in a sketched paper prototype, right? You can only see it once the system is actually running. Plus your prototyping technology might actually be slower than the final system. So oftentimes you think, well, okay, it's the prototype, right? This will get faster when we build the real system. And it may, but it may not. Um, so designers rarely specify explicit requests for responsiveness in their interface design. They will give us you know, series of screenshots and scribbles to the development team and the development team will build these dialogues and will make one dialogue go to the other one when you press a button, but how fast that's happening is not in the spec, right? It's not written down. The other problem is that programmers tend to confuse responsiveness and performance. And, uh, Responsiveness and performance, I've got two goals for, for the rest of today. I wanna to make sure that you understand very clearly that responsiveness is something different from performance. And I want you to understand, and it's gonna come later, that latency is something very different from throughput. So let's first talk about performance and responsiveness. Um, performance is how fast your computer can go, what, what your, you know, how fast your CPU is and your disk drives and your algorithms, et cetera. But responsiveness is simply concerned about how quickly the system responds to user action. Um, and that can be done extremely fast if you are a good coder, if you write good software, even on the slowest of systems. So it has very little to do with the raw power of the machine. But it's difficult. Right, it's the, like I said, it requires you to write good, careful code, kind of like you know the various reasonably good error messages and and you know designing these things to be helpful and 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 avoiding them where possible and providing a good undo uh, strategy. This is all difficult coding, right? Um, and you know, so responsiveness is also something that needs people to write smart software. Another problem why responsiveness is often lagging is that developers tend to treat human input like machine input. You can see this actually in the original von Neumann documents, right, from the 50s when von Neumann introduced his, his architecture of the von Neumann computer. Basically, um, input and output were there. We talked about this earlier in, in this class, but they were basically just another kind of input, like the input coming in from you know, a, a communications line or from a disk drive or something like that. And human input is different. Um, if you wanted to put it to an extreme, you could say any system that is accepting human input needs to 
be considered a real-time system with hard deadlines because we need to provide feedback to human input within hard deadlines. Otherwise, you know, the system will not feel responsive and usability will suffer greatly. So we're talking about real-time um, systems here, real-time OSs basically that you need to deal with human input in the right amount of time. And that is often not matched by what's being written in code, right? In implementations are often naive and simple. They will basically like take an, for example, take an event from the, um, I don't know, from the mouse, right? A mouse event, and then just run off and deal with it and do everything that needs to be done about that mouse event before they listen for the next event. And that means that if what they needed to do included writing a huge disk file out to, to disk, uh, then it will block user input for quite a while, right? It will make the system freeze. And obviously you don't want that. The other thing or another issue is that it's actually not easy um, to find good tools to develop responsive software. So I can run a performance uh, analyzer over my code, right? There's, there's usually tools in your development chain that I do that, but very few, if any, contain tools that let you actually measure how responsive your code is, like how quickly it reacts to user input, for example. And then, of course, a lot of the problems that we are encountering with responsiveness are coming from the fact that we're moving more and more computation and interaction online. So less and less of it is happening just locally on a computer, an isolated computer where you can provide everything um, from your local system. Oftentimes you need external resources that are somewhere on the web um, in order to provide whatever it is that the user needs. And that introduces delays, but everybody knows that these delays can be there. So if we wanted to, we could pay attention to them. It's just that we often don't. Let me give you a very simple example. Take a scroll bar, okay? We've all seen scroll bars. How does it work? Does it scroll text as you move it? Like, as does, does the text move as you move the scroll bar? So the text move with the scroll bar, which is good. Or does it, do you drag it to a target location and only when you let go, the text jumps to that new location? I've seen both, right? They both exist. And it's clear which one will get implemented if the designer doesn't specify what to do. And both are possible behaviors. The left one is better, right? The continuous update with the scroll bar. But you can already tell because you guys know your coding, the right one is way easier to implement, right? I basically enter this, you know, scroll bar gets moved thing, and then I only listen for an event when the scroll bar gets released in the end, and only then I update once my new text view to show the right part of the document, right? That's peanuts, right? The other one is much harder, where I need to react to every movement of the mouse. How often do I do this, and how many times a second, and how much CPU does that take, blah, blah, blah. So as a developer, if the designer doesn't specify that they want the uh, scroll bar explicitly to move continuously uh, with the text, or the text moves continuously with the scroll bar, then they will developer will pick, make a decision, and that will usually be the technically simplest one. And that's okay. Now, that's to be expected from a developer because most developers, unlike you guys who are in DIS one now, um, are not trained in user interface theory and concepts. Just as UI designers are generally not trained in implementing large software products in C plus plus, right? That's just a different education. But since the developer in the end makes decisions that the designer should have made already, who, knew, who knows that stuff, the decision that's made is not an informed one or it's made for the wrong reasons and therefore leads to bad usability. So as I said, responsiveness is not performance. First of all, um, Processing resources will always be limited, right? Um, even if you have um, faster and faster processors, we end up with mobile devices that then have much uh, more restricted computational power. So we drop down in the available raw computing power. But 
even if we didn't have this up and down from mobile technology being introduced and, and, and new technologies entering the smart battery operated low powered device uh, realm all the time, even then we are still looking at the hourglass uh, on our computer as much as 15 years ago. Even though the computer is now what, like a thousand, a million times faster, like we've moved from you know, a megahertz to a gigahertz range. Um, why are we still seeing these delays? Well, for the reasons that we talked about, right? And most people haven't realized that UIs are actually real-time systems with hard deadlines based on human cognitive processes that you guys know about from the KLM model, for example. Uh, sorry, from, from the uh, CMN model. And one thing that very few people realize when they're writing code um, but that is extremely important when you want to write responsive software is that your software doesn't need to do everything instantly. Like when I do get that mouse click to um, open a large drawing, right? Uh, I don't need to load that entire drawing immediately, right? I can maybe just load part of it that's gonna be visible on screen and then load the rest later on once I've taken care of showing the first part to the user so they get feedback. I may also be able to, uh, I, I may have two tasks that I need to do, but one of them is one that should have immediate feedback to the user. So I can pull that ahead and prioritize it and do the other one as a background task. So this ordering is not always um, you know, set in stone. We can play with that as, as coders and make it so that it does the right thing for the user. And sometimes you don't even need to do something at all. Guess what, you know, user loads up a, 15 gigabyte uh, 3D file, but only ever looks at a tiny corner of it. Do we really have to load the entire file? Maybe we don't, right? Um, maybe we can just load the one that, that he's looking at and then load others as, as they're needed. So there's, there's a bunch of things that we can do um, that, that make a lot of sense. It doesn't make sense, for example, to word wrap an entire document um, if the user is not looking at you know, the later chapters at all. So in order to understand what we do need to do, we need to know about three human deadlines. And these are um, extremely important numbers that I want you guys to remember uh, because they will come back again and again. The first one you already know, 100 milliseconds or 0.1 seconds, which is the same, um, is the limit that we know from the CMN model at which users perceive something as being happening as happening at the same moment, essentially at the same instance. So anything that takes longer than 100 milliseconds uh, or even gets close to these 100 milliseconds will lead to the user perceiving a delay between cause and effect and therefore losing the, if, the feeling of physical effect, right? When I flick a physical switch to turn on a physical light, that happens immediately, right? So um, there's no delay at all. Anything that's introduced there starts making things feel awkward. And as we know, beyond 100 milliseconds, then it really becomes noticeable. So a mouse click and inverting the button is um, a typical example for the 0.1 second delay. I would actually say that even though I do say on the slide here, moving the mouse and the pointer following, um, that clearly also has a human deadline, but that human deadline is actually even more stringent than uh, 100 milliseconds. Why? Because um, the pointer following is a continuous thing happening. And if that is delayed by 100 milliseconds, it already gets very icky. It gets very, very hard to use. Um, it's even worse with a touch screen. When I see my finger on the touch screen, and I'm moving an objects underneath the touch screen along with my finger, then even delays from 10 or 20 milliseconds become noticeable because I'm seeing the lag, the physical lagging behind of the, of the object on the screen as I move my mouse or, or, as, or as I move my finger. So it depends on the interactions, but we, what we can remember is discrete interactions like pushing a button that are supposed to trigger something, an event or a sequence of events or the beginning of a process need to get some kind of feedback, some kind of feedback within 100 milliseconds. Now, we have a little bit more time um, with the next human deadline. That's one second. 
a one second is about the time of turn taking in conversation. So if I were to address somebody here in, in, in the audience and uh, ask them a question, and then I would stop for the answer, I would say, okay, so, you know, what did you have for lunch three days ago? And after about a second, we would expect that person to make some kind of acknowledgement that they've heard my question, not necessarily answer it, uh, although, you know, in a typical conversation, that's about the turn taking that's going on, but at least some kind of reaction uh, to the fact that they've been addressed. I don't expect that in 100 milliseconds, I expect that within one second. Right? One second is also roughly the time uh, that it takes humans to react to unexpected events. Not talking about the uh, 240 milliseconds that we observed in, you know, you're watching your screen, you're waiting for a light to turn on, light turns on, you press a button, right? That can be done in a quarter second. But I'm talking about, you know, you cycling down the road and all of a sudden, um, you know, a kid jumps out from behind a car. You have this, what we, we call the Schrecksekunde in German, that one second of, of reaction time where like, <gasps> You know, you, you, have, you have to react to an unexpected event. What does that mean for system design? Well, let's take the example of opening a big file, right? I click a button. Within 100 milliseconds, I need to invert that button so that the user can see that I clicked it, right? that, that he has been heard right? on the very physical level of the interaction. Then I have one second of time to either load the file and show it, or if, it, if that takes longer, at least show some kind of progress indicator or um, open a window that starts showing the file. Do something that shows me, yep, the process has started. Right? So if the file can be loaded in a second, great. But if it cannot, then after one second, a progress indicator needs to show up and show that, that we're working on it. Similarly, an autosave function. It's okay for a system to go sort of, to become a little unresponsive for up to one second, because that time we can tolerate, um, like when it's doing an autosave, right? But if it takes any longer than that, then the system will feel like it's hanging. And then we have the third deadline, 10 seconds. This is the typical human attention span, which is you know really low and that's a really sad story, but that's how it is. Um, what that means for us as inter interface designers is that um, this should be the maximum time it takes to do a step within a task, like entering a check into a banking program or completing one step of a, a wizard should not take much longer than that. It's also the maximum time you, you have to finish giving input for a task, like, for example, from selecting a print menu entry to, to sending off the print job. Um, this one, the 10 second one, is often interesting. Um, when you have something that takes longer, let's say the user opens, lo loads, downloads a really large file, that will take two minutes, right? So he will start the download, he will look at the progress bar for a few seconds, and then he will realize, and that's about after 10 seconds, this is not interesting anymore, right? I know now this is going to take longer than 10 seconds. So their attention is going to go to something else. They're going to be doing, you know, updating their Facebook status or whatever. Um, they're gonna be working on something else. And that means that when we are finally done with loading that file, we need to do something that lets the user know that the job is done so that they can return to it. Or if they return in between, we need to make sure that they get the information to mentally switch into this task again, because we've lost them, right? After 10 seconds, you may need to assume that you've essentially lost the user to something else and that they need to come back to you. Um, and only when they come back to you, then you know that means that you have a little bit of extra work to do to get them back on track with the task at hand. To reestablish context, basically. So how can we design for responsiveness? Well, you need to meet these human deadlines, right? That's the first thing. Um, you need to rely on these three deadlines and recognize the differences of them. So acknowledge user input immediately, 0.1 seconds, display a busy in progress indicator. You got a little bit more time for that. You don't need to do that if your process, it doesn't make sense to pop up a progress bar for like a 0.5 second interaction, right? Then the process will be there and will be gone and, and the result will be there. That's too, too jarring. But after one second, something needs to be happening. 
Um, or even better, if you know it's going to take longer than one second, pop up the, uh, the progress indicator immediately right, and show it. Um, use these kinds of indicators, busy and progress indicators. A busy indicator just says, you know, spinning wheel, hourglass, I'm doing something. I can't tell you how long it takes. I don't know. Whereas the progress indicator actually tells me how long it, it's going to take to, to do the task, right? So it's more informative. But use these as often as you can. Even if you think this shouldn't take long, you wouldn't believe how much software is out there that was written in a time when people were you know, basically opening files uh, locally. Um, and now, and, and that made the assumption that opening a file locally, unless it's a ginormous file, like you know, loading a text file will never take longer than a fraction of a second, right? That was the assumption. So these 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 applications never included progress indicators for the loading operation. Now people are loading their files from their cloud accounts and from their Dropbox or whatever, um, and it, it's coming in over an edge connection on a smartphone, and it takes a long time. And suddenly, you know, loading that file takes like ten seconds, and there is no progress indicator because nobody expected it. So put them in, and make sure that they trigger at last, at least when you find that it takes you longer than a second to actually react. For progress bars, we've talked about what you need. they need to be. They need to be real, uh, which means show overall progress and, and in actual time, not, not an estimate um, that, that keeps changing. Um, and show the total items remaining, not, you know, I've, I've seen these progress bars that tell me for every library that gets installed out of 50 libraries, how many files have been installed for that library. I don't care, right? I want to know what's the overall progress. And don't hang at 99%, please. You know, uh, progress bars only make sense then if they advance about linearly. And the estimated time should always go down, never, never up, right? So rather overestimate a bit in the beginning and then correct it. But don't jump around, you know, that's, that's a very common mistake too. And don't be too precise if you don't actually know, right? Less than a minute is better uh, than 47 seconds because first of all, you're lying. You don't know, you know, whether it's really going to be 47 seconds anyway. And, you know, since you don't know really, less than a minute is totally enough and, and appropriate for the user as uh, to make a decision whether they want to stick around or not. Here, now, now we're getting into um, how can we actually structure the um, actual code that is doing the task to make it smarter? Let me give you an example of uh, how to draw a clock when you're smart. Um, it used to be in, uh, in the old days that the, uh, the Unix system, the X window system, would render a clock and it would render that over a network onto somebody else's screen because X is you know, a distributed window system. And you know, network lines were really slow back then. So the system was designed so that it would draw this clock actually in a, uh, in a particular order. Um, and I think I can show you this. Here it is. Um, it would first draw the hour uh, and minute hand in fact, it would first draw just the hour hand to give you a first indicator roughly what time it is, then would add the minute hand to give you a bit more of an estimate. Even if you just saw the first one, you'd say, ah, it's about one o'clock. Then you get the second one. Okay, so about quarter to one. And then it would add you know, some tick marks for the main directions. And that would already tell you, oh, probably you know, 11.46 maybe. And only after that, at the very end, it would you know draw these other lines around it, uh, and that would fill in things. And you could see, okay, so it's not quite eleven forty-six, right? And this was very smart, smartly done because even if it was an extremely slow connection, as soon as you started the clock program, you could immediately tell roughly what time it was, and your information was growing um, over time, rather than first drawing the you know the face, and then putting the hands in at the last moment. Uh, where I would look at it for a long time, possibly without any information available. So that's an example for displaying the important information first. The second thing is you can work in parallel. You should delegate work that isn't time critical to a background process. Um, meaning that if there are things happening, like, you know, for example, um, 
Apple's photo app is, is, is looking for faces in the photos and marking them with names, uh, that is not time critical, right? This can be happening in the background process. I don't want to look at a frozen application that says, oh, I'm updating my, my face recognition file and please wait for 15 seconds until I'm done, right? We don't want to see that. Um, even downloading an update, right? That can happen in the, in the background until it's actually available to be installed. And then it can, you know, that can pop into the foreground. You also want to work ahead by preparing likely requests. So for example, um, on Google Maps, when you're scrolling through a map, you're looking at a particular tile at the time, right? That gets downloaded. But actually Google Maps is smart enough to download the neighboring tiles in the background while you're looking at the one that you're looking at because you're not doing anything. The system is just sitting there twiddling its thumbs. So it's using that time to download some more tiles around the current one so that when you scroll scrolling, it already has these available. That's smart coding, right? Ahead, working ahead by preparing likely requests. Um, to give you another example, um, Opera has a wonderful feature um, for downloading files. When you download a file in Opera, it will, you will say download this, you click on the download button, and then it will pop up this dialogue that says, where do you want to store this file, right? A typical thing. Um, and while you are looking at that dialogue, it's already started downloading the file. It's putting it into a temp directory somewhere, but it knows that you know once you've picked a destination, you want that download complete as fast as possible. So why not start now that we know you want to download it? Uh, a naive implementation would first wait for the target directory to be given, and then we'll start the download, right? That's easier to code, but it's the worst user experience. Right? So these are the smart things that good developers do in their code. And that's what makes software shine and makes it feel like it's oozing quality and it's a joy to use rather than struggling through the tasks with clumsy, naive implementations. So if you've got more than one task to do, sort them, look at all of them and prioritize them um, and make sure that you have always, that you're always working at the most important things. For example, um, you can manage time depending on, you know, how much time you have. So this is an example here uh, taken from WordStar. Um, WordStar was a software, um, a, a word editor um, developed in, in the, the 70s, right? It ran on a one megahertz computer and it, it went away when IBM PC came out and, and Word came out and so on. Um, it was written by somebody who was not, you know, a, a top developer, but he knew uh, that his software wasn't gonna be very fast. So he made it, made the system responsive instead. What that meant was that WordStar would never drop a character that you typed. Even though the system might be busy and, and slow in, in, in catching up the display of things, it would never lose a typed character. And that sounds like a perfectly valid thing to go for in your, in your input processing, right? You don't want, if a user punches a key, they meant punching that key. So don't lose that input. Otherwise you're destroying their work. Um, also, Whenever you typed a character, that character was always shown on the screen instantly. So if WordStar was busy, for example, scrolling or, or reformatting a document in the background, and that took too long uh, to keep up, it would pause these things and just make sure that whenever it got a key input, it would immediately put that key on the screen because it knew that that was where the user was looking and that was where they needed the instant feedback. In fact, you might see WordStar under heavy load stopping to update the, you know, the top and bottom lines of the, of the scrolling area might get out of date. It might contain gibberish, you know, uh, double lines, et cetera, but it would always make sure that the letter that needed to be typed was there. And only if once that was taken care of, it would do the other tasks. So adjust your strategy if you can't keep up with what's coming in. And if you need to, you can decrease the quality of, of your output or the quantity of your updates in order to keep up with what's coming in. That's an important responsiveness design technique. Testing under different conditions is another one. 
um, for example, um, you know, you need, it, it's very tempting as a developer to just test it with the development computer that you have, which is going to be high performance because you probably have a good development machine. You're going to be on a fast network um, and, and you test with your setup and everything's fine. But you need to remember that you need to test under heavy loads, lots of other things happening on your computer, test on slower systems like the ones that your customers are likely to have, and test over slow net connections, right? Here's an example of, you know, see how well that software works when you're on a one bar edge connection, which is still technically a, a internet connection, but you know, not really fast at all. And your system should still feel responsive. It doesn't mean that it needs to do magic in order to bring data rates over edge that edge just doesn't have, but you can still build a system that will feel responsive with these limitations. Now, um, we can look at a few performance limitations um, that are inside your code and inside your, your more like software-oriented decisions that you make. And this is kind of a preview of the kinds of things we will be talking about in DIS2 next semester in the summer uh, when we really peel back you know, the, the user interface layer and look at the code behind it. And this is when in DIS2 DIS you will start understanding how you build a system that reacts to events immediately, that distributes events to the right application, that updates windows, that moves pointers, that you know, handles multi-touch events. We'll talk about all that magic uh, in the next semester. But these are a few um, basic heuristics. Um, one of my PhD students went to have an internship at Apple. And while, of course, they can usually talk about nothing that they did there, um, uh, he was at least able to share some of the um, practitioners' tips that, that um, Apple developers were sharing with each other in order to keep their, uh, their software high performance. And so he brought this back as a, as a as sort of the top five list of performance hits that, um, that Apple developers had seen um, in, in existing code. The worst thing that you could do was synchronous I.O. operations on, uh, on storage devices. Now, I'm not even talking about, you know, moving storage, right? You know, hard disks, uh, those are quickly becoming a thing of the past. And of course they are terribly slow, um, but it still is a serious impact even if you write to an SSD, right? Or if you get something from an SSD. Um, and this is also true for any other uh, uh, synchronous IO. So for example, if you do synchronous uh, network IO, um, then, you know, that's also that's also a terrible performance hit, but we know that that's true for a long time because networks have been terribly slow to begin with, and there are good asynchronous APIs, right? Asynchronous APIs meaning that you don't have to wait for the result before you move on doing other stuff, right? So synchronous I/O on uh, on mass storage is is you know kind of like the worst thing you can do. So try to cache things, and if you need to get something from um, you know, these disks try to use async um, operations. Next up is that, um, you know, assuming that you've loaded everything into, into main memory that you need, um, we got to say that even if it's in main memory, modern uh, multiprocessor architectures are not too good at keeping things in their fast data caches, right? Um, so a large memory footprint of your application will actually also lead to um, performance hits for two reasons. First of all, large memory footprint means that you know, data cannot all be kept in, in the caches, in the processor caches. Uh, and so there's more uh, going out into main memory to, to fetch data. Um, and secondly, if you take up too much uh, memory, then your system might start swapping, right? Taking memory pages and outlay, um, putting them out onto disk in order to swap the data from some other process in and use that instead. And that means hard disk access. And even if it's an SSD, uh, see rule number one, we want to avoid that at all costs. Oftentimes, to avoid a large memory footprint, it is actually faster these days to recompute uh, data um, than having it somewhere in memory right? and, and then having to fetch it onto the right core with lots of effort. So think about recomputing rather than uh, storing in, in memory. Sometimes that's faster. But 
the next thing um, that is a major performance hit in today's code, oftentimes in practice, when, when we look at existing apps, is um, that threads are interlocking, right? Uh, Multi-thread coding is really tricky, as you know, right? If you try to implement explicit multi-threading, you are really asking for trouble. Um, asking for a lock, which you need to do if you're writing multi-threaded code, is expensive in most architectures. Um, and oftentimes, if you do explicit multi-threading and you really write your threaded code yourself, um, you're not getting that much of a benefit out of it because often threads are have to go through common critical areas uh, where they need to be interlocked anyways. So what's the solution? Well, on modern operating systems, the trend is going away from writing explicit multi-threaded code and really rather using things like closures or blocks um, or lambdas. Um, these are basically code blocks that a global dispatcher will, will manage. Um, MacOS calls it Grand Central Dispatch. And uh, it will then decide how many threads to create so that you know, the, the operating system can decide this dynamically because it knows how many CPU kernels are available and whether parts of this code may even be able to be executed on the graphics card rather than on your CPU. Um, so you don't have to deal with explicit uh, multi-threading the system is taking care of the multi-threading for you and you just specify blocks of code that can be run in parallel um, based on the dependencies that they have. And um, by you picking the right kinds of queuing, you basically are steering the parallelization level and the priority prioritization of, of tasks. Next up four out of five is, the, is having unsuitable data and control structures. Um, so for example, iterating over a large array, we all know and love our arrays. They're like the number one data structure we learned probably on day two of our computer science studies, but a hash map, even though it is a little more, you know, trickier to implement, um, is often a better choice, right? Rather than iterating over a large ar array, which it, you know, immediately leads to O of N uh, runtimes. Another classic. Uh, that is closely related are you know, invariant code inside loops that should be factored out of the loop so that it doesn't get executed every time. Or um, um, multiple uh, loops that are nested, nested loops that uh, should probably rather be formulated as a SIMD, so single instruction, multiple data streams, um, uh, block of code so that the vector units of, of the CPU or even the GPU can, can run them effectively. And the final one, and that, that may actually be the one that you fall for most easily, is that um, we developers love reinventing the wheel. We love writing our own classes as soon as we encounter a non-trivial problem. Um, but if you end up writing your own framework for 3D animation or for solving you know, uh, uh, linear uh, equation systems, you are very likely you know, to be slower and, and less performant than what's already out there as existing frameworks. So these days, coding is much more about um, finding the right framework and using it efficiently and understanding how to use it efficiently, understanding how it's expected to be used efficiently um, because these are optimized and tested you know a thousand a million fold and um, you probably won't be able to um, implement something more effective and more efficient in the time that you have available if you do reinvent the try to reinvent the wheel the only wheel that you will likely reinvent or or discover is often at least on the mac then the uh, the spinning pizza of death as they call it or the spinning beach ball of death, which leads to, uh, means that the system is currently busy and unresponsive. Let's move on to the last section of today's class. And this is gonna be about latency. When I, um, you know, the other day I was sitting down with my, my wife and we we're playing a little video game um, on a computer. 
And uh, somehow things felt a little slow. Uh, it felt like we didn't quite have the control, the immediate control over uh, things on the screen as we were hoping to have. And of course that couldn't be because of our age. So it had to be the technology, right? Um, and so I went ahead and tried to investigate. Now, just as a refresher here, um, if you think about what's happening on a, on a computer screen when you're playing a game, uh, it's a typical task that requires, you know, instant reactions to on-screen events, right? So bad guy appears on the screen, you need to react, you need to fire or, or, or you know, evade or something. And this is actually quite well understood as a, as a task. In fact, you guys have learned a model for this already, right? Um, and the model is the model human processor. There is a guy looking at a screen, seeing something, recognizing it, deciding to act on it, and then pressing a button in the simplest possible case. So we know that this task uh, takes a certain time, right? Um, and that time, as you guys may recall, was uh, what again? Anybody like to venture a guess? What's the time this takes? Since, since at this point, nobody has turned on their video, I'm just gonna randomly pick a person here. How about um, Christina? Christina, if you're still there, I don't really know because all I'm seeing is black squares, but if you're there and have a guess as to how long it takes to react to an on-screen uh, symbol appearing, let me know. See, and this is why I hate everybody turning off their video camera. I, I'm talking to a bunch of black squares and I don't even know whether you guys are still there. It's incre incredibly frustrating as a teacher. Uh, Marco, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I would say, uh, <clears throat> so reacting completely to what we see, understanding what we see, and then actually acting like motorically to it, it takes us, as you can see here, 100 plus 70 plus 70, so mm -hmm. 240 um, micros, or was it milliseconds? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's good to know your micro versus milliseconds there. Um, yeah, micro is, it's too fast. We're not that yeah, that, fast. that would be uh, very maybe. fast. Yeah, this is milliseconds. Exactly. About a quarter of a second. It sounds about right too, right? From, from what we, what we feel. So, and you're right. This is your, your very basic reaction to things, right? When you, when you just go in and, and, and you have a light going on and you have to press a button. Now there may be some more complex decisions you need to make um you know like uh is it is it a friendly or is it an enemy appearing and do i need to shoot him or you know whatever um and then that will take more time because our our cognitive processor up here will do a couple more cycles to, to determine what what needs to happen okay but that's what you know bubblehead uh tells us about 240 milliseconds right that's that's our estimate now um Let's think for a moment about what that means when you write code. Let's assume you want to test that assumption. You want to test whether the 240 milliseconds are actually correct. Um, what kind of code would you write? Again, um, anybody want to take a guess? What, what would the code look like that you would need to write to test this? Very In very rough terms. Oh, I see faces appearing. There's actually people behind all these squares. I'm amazed, at least a couple. Thank you. Um, yeah, Marco, you want to uh, take a guess? Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say it depends. It's more like situational because of depending on what they have to react to and uh, what what is perceived as reaction. So if you're so, talking about, for example, shooter games, we can, so to speak, see the screen of the person, for example. So let's say if they want to shoot an enemy player, then we can we can code what is perceived on the screen. So for mm -hmm. example, that is the moment of where they can react. Mm -hmm. And from the moment they start shooting is where they actually react. So it's like the moment where enemy comes to the screen mm -hmm. all the way to the point where they click the, uh, the mouse button, for example. Exactly, 
exactly. So you, know, you picked you know, the, the enemy coming to the screen. Um, I'll, I'll, make, I'll show you an example here that's much more simplified, but it's exactly what you said. You are basically writing some code that starts here on the left and that outputs something, right? It could just be make the screen turn yellow instead of black or, or print you know, a big fat letter on the screen, whatever it is, some visual stimulus anyway that goes out on the screen. And then we know the CMN model starts doing its thing, right? You know, bubblehead guy starts to do his thing. And at some point we will recognize that he's done something, which is when we get, you know, a callback that is called key pressed or something, right? There will be some kind of interrupt coming in, some kind of callback routine that will get triggered that we can write where we can react to an incoming key press. Now, how that works in detail, if you haven't written much interactive uh, code yet, You'll learn all about that in DIS2, so I hope to see you there in summer. But for now, that should be enough to understand. And we know that this green arrow here um, is basically 240 milliseconds, right? That's, that's our assumption. But uh, let me fill in a few things here. We are making this an assumption here because from the moment we issue the print command on the computer, the computer may take some time to actually show that let's say we print a big fat green A on the screen, right? To show that big fat letter on the screen. And only once that actually visually appears on the screen, the user can start perceiving it, right? So we have currently assumed that this takes zero milliseconds, right? Because we have not factored in any time for that. We assume every delay between our print statement and the key pressed statement happening, if we were to measure that with a timer and software, all that would we would expect be to be human uh, latency, but it's not. Some of that is going to be the latency of the display doing its thing and rendering the that letter. Then the guy presses the button after he thought about it, right? For about 240 milliseconds. Then we get a button press, but from the moment he presses that button to the moment we actually get called in our routine key pressed, we get the callback again. We are assuming that that takes essentially no time at all, maybe a few CPU cycles, right? And we're running a computer at what, like, you know, two gigahertz. So it's going to be ignored, right? Because as Marco said, microseconds, um, you know, microseconds are the amount of things that we need to worry about when we're running a gigahertz computer, right? Uh, sorry, a, a megahertz computer. With, my, with gigahertz, we are like, you know, even faster. We're down to, nanoseconds per cycle. So it's really, we can ignore that time, we think. But is that assumption right? So I'm going to call this first part your display latency, right? Between me issuing a command in code that says I'll put something on the screen and that information actually physically appearing on the screen. And I'm going to call the second one input latency. That's the time between somebody physically pressing a button in the easiest case and me getting to recognize that physical key press um, in, my, in my piece of code. And as I said, right now, we're assuming that would be zero milliseconds each. But if we fill in our, um, our letter in here, we can turn around this question because what you just saw is actually really tricky to test, right? How am I gonna verify how much of that is going to be the human and how much of it is going to be the time that the system takes to print because I don't get any notification when this when this stuff appears on screen. I don't know, right? So if I were to test this with an experiment that still involved a human reacting to something appearing on screen, that's a bad experimental design because I would still have the human in the loop and I would have their 240 milliseconds plus or minus in there and I couldn't tell how much of it was actually the system and how much was the user. So we're gonna design a different experiment. That experiment looks like this. Somebody presses a button. We recognize that key press in our software. We react immediately on the next line of code with a print statement that puts something out on the screen. And then that gets rendered on the screen. And if we, if we can measure the time it takes from the user actually closing that button switch, to that stuff appearing on the screen, then we have also measured input latency because that's this part and we've measured display latency. We've just swapped around you know, the order of the two. 
And what's beautiful is we have eliminated the human reaction out of the experiment. That clear so far? Does that make sense? And we are now making another assumption that, you know, this stuff in between, key press to print, will take zero milliseconds. But I think that's assumption we can easily make because, as I said, we're executing code at, you know, a nanosecond per instruction, so we don't need to worry about that time. And so now the interesting thing is um, that this takes the human out of the loop, and we know, that's another nice thing, this time should be below 100 milliseconds. Why? Because that is exactly what we talk about when we when we introduce the human deadline from from Jeff Johnson, or when we talk about you know cause and effect in in our first lectures. When you press a button and something is supposed to happen as a reaction to that button press, like inverting the button on the screen, for example, that should take no longer than a hundred milliseconds. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to feel connected anymore, right? So, um, what I ended up doing is I uh, ran an experiment. I started my, uh, I was playing a game that was simulating an old computer. Like uh, this is my home computer from the 1980s, an old piece of, piece of garbage these days. Um, and so I opened up the joystick. I hooked up an oscilloscope to it. And here's the button, right? With the two connections. And I put a little light dependent resistor on the screen that will change its resistance when it sees a different color. And so all I had to do now was basically close the joystick, switch, you know, press the button on the, on the joystick, and then wait for the screen to change. Because the code I wrote for this was literally two lines of assembler code. Right? It looked for the joystick input, which on this old um, uh, vintage machine was simply reading a certain port ad address. And then setting the color of the border of the screen was another um, command to, that was also a port command in assembler. And then th that was my loop, right? So this is like a, this, this computer was only running at a megahertz or so, but still it was super fast, right? So we're talking about microseconds for this whole loop. So here the code is as fast as it can possibly be. So this computer is now reacting as fast as it possibly can, or this, this program is reacting as fast as it possibly can to input. But I was playing that game, not on that 80s vintage machine, I was playing it on an emulator, right? So the emulator was running on a modern, high-end gigahertz range MacBook Pro, and it was using modern input devices like a, a USB joystick. And it was using a modern output device like an HDMI, HDMI display. And this was the setup that had felt laggy somehow. And so what did the oscilloscope tell me when I did the study? This. And this shows you that you know the yellow line shows the, the button press dropping the voltage on the on the button line. And the blue line shows you when the light dependent resistor starts seeing the screen change color. And if you read this uh, correctly here, one step here is 25 milliseconds. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. This is 150 milliseconds of delay between me pressing a button and my computer, which is simulated on, on the Mac, actually being able to change color. And that's way too much, right? I measured, in fact, anything between 130 milliseconds of base latency. And then if I did this multiple times, I realized something else. The actual values actually changed much more drastically than that because it introduced jitter. What does jitter mean? Jitter means that a value isn't staying at the same level, but it goes up and down. It has noise around it, basically. So sometimes the delay would only be 50 milliseconds, and in other times, the delay would be more like 200 milliseconds. It was changing all the time. I tried this with different emulators, you know, different um, external uh, HDMI screens, et cetera. Um, even with a native app on the Mac, it always remained the same. You know? like 100 milliseconds of delay or more than that, and then lots of jitter in addition to that. So what does that mean? Um, imagine yourself playing an action game, right? And the action game is, I don't know, you, you've got things going by that, that, you need to, that you need to hit, right? So at the right point, when something is right here, you need to shoot. With 100 milliseconds delay, that becomes hard because you need to actually shoot before the thing is there. 
Now, if you can see it approaching, you can do that. But if it suddenly appears, you're at a dis you're as a disadvantage. So you can only react 100 milliseconds later. But the jitter is even worse because jitter means that you cannot learn the delay between you pressing the button and the reaction happening on screen. It's going to be different every time. So that means if you're trying to, you know, regularly hit certain ob obstacles in your game, you're going to miss every time because once it reacts almost immediately, the other time it, it delays by 200 milliseconds. It's a mess, right? And our high scores were telling. Um, so what that means is there is some significant delay in the system. So this could still be coming from anywhere. It could be coming from the operating system. It could be coming from my code even maybe, maybe the application, the emulator running, or it could be the peripherals. I didn't know. So I ran another test. I dug out my own old home computer from the 1980s. Um, I plugged in a, US, a, um, a, a joystick from the 1980s that literally just has this simple cable where if you connect this and close this button, it directly basically is wired into a CPU pin on, on the computer through the port, right? There's no nothing going on in between, no USB protocol, no serial protocol, nothing. I also exchanged my output device from my HDMI monitor to an old junkyard TV, analog TV. And I tested this on a computer, remember, that was running at one megahertz, right? So it was about one thousandth or one two thousandths uh, the speed of my modern computer. The latency between input and output with the same experiment, close the button joystick, to seeing the screen change dropped and it dropped to anything between zero and 20 milliseconds. Now that's amazing, right? This is so fast. This is way below the 100 milliseconds that we identified as the problem uh, you know, threshold for getting causality problems and, and starting to a system to feel laggy. And, but in between the zero and 20 milliseconds, I saw things basically equally distributed. Sometimes it was zero, sometimes it was 20. So I basically had jitter in anywhere between zero and 20 milliseconds, but no additional delay, zero additional delay, only the 20 milliseconds of jitter. Now, can anybody tell me where the 20 milliseconds of jitter were coming from? Because they were actually unavoidable. I pretty much knew that they would be there even before I started this experiment. Yeah, Freddy, what do you think? Uh, maybe from the CRT. Uh, so basically, due to the scan lines on uh, and the the, the um, residual uh, image on on the display. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's very close to that. It is actually simply the refresh rate of the CRT. Uh, so whether the CRT did scan lines or whether it would replace the entire screen at once, in both cases, it only happens at 50 hertz, right? This display was running at 50 hertz, which is a typical uh, a typical rate for, for computer uh, screens and TVs and so on. In the US, it's often 60, but this was running at 50 hertz. So every 50th of a second, and in your case, really, you're right, uh, the scan line, you know, the, the, the little dot was, was passing by on the, on, the, on, the, on the CRT tube at that point where I was holding the, L, the, the, the resistor. So if I happen to press, the button right after the scan line had passed my resistor, then it, I would have to wait for the screen to be built completely up to that point again, which is exactly one frame, exactly 20 milliseconds at 50 Hertz, right? Um, for the reaction to be shown. If I happen to press the button right before the computer would get to that scan line, it would show almost immediately. Now, this is not new, right? Uh, this gamers know this and and for sure when we played the same game on our 1980s home computer that I dug out of the closet uh, we had better high scores than on you know the modern emulation on the 2020 computer um, I did more tests with this and I found that um, by just using for example a, an HDMI display and uh, and a USB joystick or, or vice versa and I found that, both of them, both USB and HDMI, are adding uh, latency. Very roughly speaking, they both add about the same amount of latency to it. Uh, but the jitter came from USB. 
So USB was introducing this problem that the latency was actually changing that significantly. I did a final test, uh, and this is a, a, an FPGA-based um, modern rebuild of this, this ancient computer. FPGAs, if you don't know, field programmable gate arrays will put the actual logic of a chip um, and, and re-implement it on that new chip. So you don't run software on an FPGA. It's basically the actual wires get, you know, the actual transistors get rewired to be like the old uh, CPU. And on that thing, with the old input devices, I have to say, with the old um, direct nine pin, you know, Atari style joystick from the eighties and with an old CRT, I also saw zero to 20 milliseconds of delay. So this clearly shows a couple of interesting things. Um, the delay was not coming from the slow computer where you would think it would go away, but the delay was actually introduced with the new computers because of the serial protocols that the input device uses, was USB, and the serial protocol that HDMI uses, because also HDMI is a fairly complex protocol. It encrypts the data because of digital rights management and all that in a mess, and it gets sent to the computer, uh, to the screen. The screen tries to maybe optimize the brightness or adjust to certain, you know, um, uh, color profiles and, and whatnot, it scales up to more pixels on the screen if you are giving it a low resolution image. And all that is done fast, but it takes time. Right? Now, what that meant is that if you run a, uh, a, a psychology experiment on a modern computer, you are reading completely false data. Because you might think that you're seeing a delay of the user reacting to a button press of, let's say, 400 milliseconds. But about the half of that is actually the computer being slow, not, not, your, not your human. And that is very different from what you would expect. Now, psychologists know this, and psychologists have used these things like this. This is a device called a tachistoscope that would actually show very quick light flashes to users and measure their reaction time to it. And uh, these things were, were invented in the 1800s, and, and this is a model from the 1980s. Uh, and, and if you're a professional psychologist doing nothing else but reaction uh, time studies, you know all this stuff and you stay well aware, away from you know, USB and HDMI displays and you use these kinds of special setups to really avoid all that latency. But what I wanted to point out to you is um, that latency is crucial in every interactive system because latency means the delay between me interacting with it and the system reacting as a response. You need to stay well below 100 milliseconds for obvious reasons for that. Um, and lots of modern systems don't do that. Right? If you use USB and HDMI, if you use simple low you know, quality USB devices, like a simple gamer joystick, um, you will introduce not just massive latency into your system that is on the order of the human reaction time, but you will also introduce jitter which makes it even harder to control something with that. And this is not just a thing for gamers, right? This is also a thing um, if you are a fast typist working on, on a word processor, uh, this will affect you, right? If you see the delay, if, if you're a coder who is fast at typing, writing code, or whether you're a secretary typing letters, if you see a delay, it will make you feel getting disconnected from the, from the system and it will impede your performance. You will start making mistakes that you wouldn't make otherwise. HDMI, as a quick reminder, that's what my experiments showed me was HDMI adds lag and USB adds lag and jitter if you don't pay attention to it. Now there are ways to get rid of that. USB, for example, has a special high powered mode where it will read the uh, bus, it will pull the bus every millisecond rather than at these rather random intervals that it currently does um, in, in the default setup. Uh, and then you can bring down that USB latency and jitter uh, massively. But normal drivers and normal and, and you know, cheap uh, peripherals don't do that. And this may be one of the reasons why some you know, devices, USB devices, uh, quality manufactured devices with good drivers are actually more expensive and work better. Um, why am I showing this picture of people passing buckets? Because I think it's important to realize the difference between throughput and latency here. Imagine they following. This bucket line of these gentlemen there goes all the way from Aachen to Cologne. And they're not passing on buckets of water. They're packing, passing on buckets full of burnt Blu-ray discs. Okay? Or, my, or maybe SSD drives packed with data. 
Now, once that bucket line is full, there's going to be a delivery of like a hundred, like, I don't know, two terabytes every second, right? That's a that's a throughput of this bucket line of two terabytes a second from Aachen to Cologne. That's monster fast. That's amazingly fast. But the latency of the bucket line from Aachen to Cologne is going to be hours, right? Until you put a new SSD drive into a bucket in Aachen and it gets passed on to Cologne and somebody hands it over to the recipient in Cologne. So that's the difference between throughput and latency. The bucket line of SSD drives from Aachen to Cologne has amazing throughput, but it has terrible latency. And this is what people often forget. They think, I'm just going to make the system faster. I'm just going to double my processor speed, or I'm going to switch to a 120 hertz display. And a 120 hertz display can be better in terms of latency, but there's no reason that it has to. It can be even worse if it has lots of processing going on before it actually shows each picture. It may show 100 pictures of a second, but it may take a long time for processing each signal until it actually ends up on the screen. So the pipeline inside the display may take a long time. Similarly with USB on the input side. So the other thing I want to say, you know, things really were better back in the day, right? So these old, <laughs> these old peripherals that were directly connecting to computer uh, to pins on the main processor were, of course, way faster than the modern serial protocols that we have uh, put into our lives. Now, of course, a joystick that directly connects to a CPU pin is, an, is a security nightmare and is probably something we're never going to see in modern technology. But we should be aware that this is the, the price we're currently paying with all these uh, protocols like USB and HDMI and any other serial protocols you're running, all the processing it's amazing throughput, but it may add latency where you don't expect it. OK, so as an experimenter, you should watch your end-to-end -to -end latency if you run any kinds of experiments in this area. As a developer, you should test your end-to-end -end latency. And it's easy to test. All you need is really you know, electronics for $5 and maybe an oscilloscope. And even those you can run um, on your smartphone. Um, and so it's easy, easy enough to to test these things, but you need to test because you can't rely on uh, especially the way into your computer and the way out of your computer to be latency free. With that, we can wrap up for today. We've talked about three things, the nine, uh, so, sorry, the 10 golden rules of interface design. We've completed the, uh, uh, the guidelines. Uh, we've talked about um, responsiveness, minimize memory loads, errors, clear exits, help documentation, diverse user needs, and hiring a graphic designer. Um, then we've taken a bit of a closer look at responsiveness and performance. And we've learned about the three human deadlines that we need to be aware of. And these are very different in their meaning. One is the immediate physical response of 0.1 seconds. The next one is the sort of turn-taking conversational one of one second where we need to start showing that we're working on the task. Um, and then we've got the 10 seconds where we lose the user's um, focus usually, and we need to be aware of that when they return to the task. Um, and we've talked about latency. We've talked about performance hits that happen in um, you know, writing code. So this is something that should apply even when you're writing code down in the bowels of the system, uh, you know, defining hard drive access uh, and storing your database somewhere. All this will impact the user interface if it starts introducing um, you know, lag and latency and, and these kinds of things. And then finally, I've shown you a little bit of an experiment uh, that I've run. Uh, and it shows you that if you, if you take a close look at what's happening around you, you can actually find out surprising details. And latency is something that we should be very aware of in modern computer systems because it has not gone away. We think that everything is getting gotten faster and faster and faster. But latency is actually something that is worse on modern technology than it was on old technology. And that's something to be aware of. Right, that concludes today's lecture. And next week, we'll have our last lecture in which we will talk about interaction design notations. So we will take a look at how can you write down what you want to specify as a designer so that it actually does make its way across to the development team. Um, I, mentioned earlier on that if you don't specify, for example, responsiveness in your design uh, uh, documents, then it's not going to be picked up by development as a, as a goal. And so the notations we introduce next week 
will help you specify your design intentions clearly in your interface design so that you or your team or another team that is developing the code, um, maybe even a remote team, can write it according to the specifications that really encode the usability requirements clearly and unmistakably. That will be the last lecture um, before we then um, get to your project presentations and the final. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and thanks for tuning in. And I hope to see you all again next week. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.